I believe that the theme of uh, this is innovative ideas, and I'd like to present two innovative ideas. The first of them uh, is dealing with activism, and the second is about our place on this planet. Uh, dealing with activism is that um, many years ago I came up with this idea that if we're going to make any changes that we have to take a different approach than what a lot of organizations have been doing, which was uh, really get, getting down to changing things through voting, petitions, and demonstrating. And I never liked protesting because protesting to me was always very submissive. And when it comes to what we were doing, saving whales, it was sort of like, please, please, please don't, say, don't kill the whales, and of course they do it anyway. And you know, all we do is take pictures and hang banners. And uh, so I decided uh, many years ago that there had to be a different approach to this. And that approach was what I call aggressive nonviolence. And that is intervening directly and aggressively in uh, order to shut down these operations. And so we decided that we would uh, target illegal activities. And that's what we've been doing for 30 years, targeting and shutting down illegal activities. And uh, in doing so, we've become quite controversial. But the most important thing about it is that we've never been convicted of a crime. We've never injured anybody. We've never had anybody injured. And we've never been sued. But during that time, we've sent nine whaling ships to the bottom and destroyed probably about $40 million worth of equipment, which is being used to take kill sharks and illegally fish and all that sort of thing. You know, back in 1985, I had this Tibetan Buddhist monk who came to me on my ship, and he handed me a little statue. And he said, I've been asked to give this to you, and you could put it up on your mast. And I didn't know what it was. It sort of was a horse-headed uh, dragon wing sort of thing. And I put it up there. You know, if a Tibetan Buddhist monk comes up and asks you to give it, you know, you do it. <laughs> Don't know much about it, but. Uh, anyway, in 1989, I had the great privilege of having uh, lunch with and, and, and talking with the Dalai Lama. And uh, I asked him about this and found out, to my great surprise, he had sent it to me. <laughs> and I said, well, that's fine, but what is it? And he says, it's called Hayagriva. And I said, well, what does that mean? He says, it's the uh, symbol for the compassionate aspect of Buddha's wrath. I said, oh, that's fine, but what does that mean? <laughs> he said, he looked at me as only the Dalai Lama could, and he said, uh, well, you never want to hurt anybody, but sometimes when they cannot see enlightenment, scare the hell out of them until they do. <laughs> so he understood our approach, and that's why um, our ships are black and we fly the Jolly Roger. And, uh, <laughs> Because if you go back to, you know, people started calling us pirates. And I said, that's fine. If you want to call us pirates, we'll be pirates. Well, the kids like it anyway. But um, if you go back to the 17th century, it wasn't the British Navy that shut down piracy in the Caribbean. There was a good reason for that. A lot of British merchants were on the take. A lot of British politicians were certainly on the take. Not much different than the way things are today. And uh, piracy flourished. Piracy is shut down by one man, Henry Morgan, a pirate. If you want to stop pirates, you need pirates to do it. Because pirates, we have the great advantage of not being encumbered by bureaucrats. We can get the job done. And so that's what we've been doing over the years, is directly intervening. And a lot of people say, well, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, but this year, after seven campaigns to the Southern Ocean, every year saving more and more whales, we drove the Japanese whaling fleet out of the Southern Oceans a month and a half early and they took only 15% of their quota, and I don't believe they will be coming back. So we are <laughs> now, now, we did this. We did this without injuring anybody, without hurting anybody, but certainly making a lot of controversy and a lot of enemies. And uh, because, you know, instead of weapons, we use uh, stink bombs and... Uh, of course, the camera being the most uh, powerful weapon ever. And I went to all the different networks and I said, look, you know, what we need uh, is to get a TV show about this. And I said, the biggest show on Discovery right now is a bunch of guys going into a very remote area of the, area, of the ocean in very rough water and catching crabs, deadliest catch. <laughs> I can give you men and women from all over the world going to a more remote part of the ocean in more dangerous conditions to save whales. And we'll throw in icebergs and penguins and make it real interesting. It's got to be more interesting than catching crabs every week. <laughs> And so uh, they all rejected it. They all rejected it. Every network rejected it. Mar Marjorie, uh, when, when uh, Cantor, when she became president of, uh, of Animal Planet, what she, uh, she had been on one of those earlier meetings, and she said, I'll, be comp I'll be take the position if you go with this show. And uh, she took the risk, and now it's the number one show on Animal Planet. So it was a risk that paid off for her. And it certainly has paid off for us, and it's paid off for the whales, because it certainly has brought this 
what is happening in this very remote area of the planet into the living rooms of people all over the world. So it was, it was highly successful in, in that way. And um, again, you know, the perception is, is that we are uh, eco-terrorists. And when people started calling us eco-terrorists, I said, oh, God, you know, here's a PR, this PR uh, agencies are working overtime. And my response to that is, arrest me or shut up, you know, because I'm sick and tired of being called names by governments and corporations who don't follow it up with the law. We have more respect for the law than they do. The fact is, we, we enforce the law. We don't break the law. I was giving a lecture at the uh, FBI Academy in Quantico two years ago. They invited me to speak to them. And one of the FBI agents says, well, you know, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty damn fine line when it comes to the law. And I said, yeah, well, who cares how fine it is as long as you don't cross it. <laughs> and they couldn't argue with that. But they said, well, people have gone into your organization and have learned the tricks of the trade and have become eco-terrorists. I couldn't figure out who that was, but, you know, I listened to them. And I said, I've had over 5,000 crew members, volunteers, so... I can't be responsible for what anybody does after they leave the organization. And one FBI agent said, you train them, you're responsible. I said, okay, I got three names from you for you. Lee Harvey Oswell, Timothy McVeigh, and Osama Bin Laden. You train them, you're responsible. <laughs> you know? so. But over the years, we found that uh, this, this does work. And now, the situation is so bad when it comes to ocean conservation that our so-called radical approach is now being courted by governments. And last month I signed a historical agreement with the president of Palau, and Sea Shepherd will now be their official enforcement. We will go in there to kick their poachers out of those waters. We've had a similar campaign in uh, the Galapagos for the last 10 years, and we're working in full partnership with the Rangers and the Ecuadorian Federal Police. Uh, we've uh, busted over 65 poaching vessels, seized over a quarter of a million shark fins, uh, hundred, oh, a couple hundred thousand sea cucumbers. We've got our own canine unit there, our own network of informants, and uh, we're trying to make a difference because our position on the Galapagos is if we can't save the Galapagos, what can we save? That's our line in the sand. And it is really a difficult thing because it's uh, one step forward and two steps backwards there. We're working with the police, we're working with the rangers, but the Navy is corrupt as possibly can be. And so, uh, and the government is really very difficult to work with. In July of 2007, the president of Ecuador gave me the Amazon Peace Prize, and in August he arrested my director because we happened to arrest friends of his. So this is the kind of things that were com coming across all the time, and it's very, very frustrating. But it's also very, very rewarding because we can see the real results of our efforts. We can actually save X number of whales or sharks or whatever, and that makes, uh, you know, certainly gives you a big morale boost to go out there and continue doing what we're doing. Now, the other thing I'd like to speak about is a different way of looking at who we are and what we are and where we are. And that is to part the anthropocentric curtain and take a look at reality from a different point of view. We believe that we are the be-all and the end-all. We're the ultimate uh, species on this planet, the most important species on the planet, the most intelligent species on the planet, but it's not true. We are not. And uh, we just have to start to look at things in a different way if we're going to survive on this planet. This is a spaceship. The Earth is a spaceship. It's hurtling around the galaxy at 500 miles a second. And like any spaceship, it has a life support system and a life support system that's maintained by a crew. Because there are two types of species on Spaceship Earth, crew and passengers. We humans are passengers. We're having a great time, entertaining ourselves and creating all sorts of fantasy worlds to live in, but we are simply passengers. We contribute nothing to running this ship, and certainly not to its life support system. The crew, they are the ones that provide the oxygen we breathe, the food we eat, they take care of the waste, they clean up our mess, they keep everything running. The problem is, is the passengers are killing the crew. We're killing off the crew. Richard Leakey said that we're now living in the sixth major extinction event in world history. We should lose more species of plants and animals between 2000 and 2065 in a 65 year period of time than we've lost over the last 65.2 million years. That rate of extinction is unprecedented as one species being responsible, and it's even got a name called the Homocene because we are responsible. The problem is, is that most of the species that are being killed off happen to be crew members on Spaceship Earth. 
Two years ago, I was severely criticized by the Fox Network in the US, uh, which I took as a compliment, but <laughs> the, because I made a statement that worms were more important than people. And everybody got simply outraged by that. How could you say something so outrageous that worms are more important than people? And my answer to that is I said it because worms are more important than people. <laughs> and the reason for that is, is that it's very simple from an ecological point of view. Worms can live on the earth without people. People cannot live on the earth without worms. We need them, they don't need us. We need bees, they don't need us. We need insects and bacteria and algae, they do not need us. We need trees, they do not need us. These are the crew that run the life support system, a spaceship Earth. We need them. And if we kill them off, we're destroying our life support system and we're gonna kill ourselves. And really, we don't have much power over this planet. We might think we do, but we don't. You know, really everything's run by bacteria anyway. And, uh, you know, in fact, we all think, we all think that we're individuals and that we can survive independent of nature. And that's just not true. Each and every one of us, it, we're not individuals. When I look at you or you look at me, you're not looking at one individual. I am a symbiont, as you are. Inside you are 800 to 1,000 species of bacteria, over two pounds of bacteria in your body, moving around, digesting your food, creating your, uh, uh, manufacturing your vitamins, grooming your eyelashes, keeping you healthy, keeping you moving. You are a symbiont, a collection of hundreds of species, and we couldn't survive without them. And we have to understand that these other species, not only do they keep our bodies functioning, they keep the planet functioning. And meanwhile, what we've done is isolated ourselves, alienated ourselves voluntarily from the natural world by creating fantasy worlds within which we live. It's so bad that even the uh, video game Warcraft has more subscribers than all of the environmental organizations in the world. People are more interested in fantasies than they are in reality. And of course, all of those other fantasies include everything from our cultural uh, beliefs to our religions to whatever. The main point is that we cannot separate ourselves from the natural world. We believe that we're the most intelligent species on the planet. That's how, because we measure what is intelligence. If a blob of protoplasm steps out of a spaceship with a ray gun, it must be intelligent because it has technology. But there is non-manipulative intelligence, the intelligence of whales, the intelligence of seals, the intelligence of elephants. I was debating a, a whaler once from Norway. He said, but Watson, you say that whales are more intelligent than people. This is an absolutely stupid thing to say. How can you say something so stupid? I said, George, I happen to believe that intelligence should be measured by the ability to live in harmony with the natural world, and by that criteria, whales are more intelligent than we are. He said, well, by that criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than we are. I said, George, you're beginning to understand what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> you know? The fact is, is that we are actually, when you look at it from an ecological point of view, probably one of the dumbest creatures on the planet because we have separated ourselves from the natural laws of ecology, the law of diversity, that the strength of an eco ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it, that the law of interdependence, that all of those species are interdependent with each other. As John Muir once said, tug on any part of the earth, we'll, you will find it intimately connected with every other part of the earth. And the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth, a limit to carrying capacity, and for human populations to continue to grow, we literally have to steal the carrying capacity for other species, and they must go extinct for our numbers to increase. And that is the price that is being paid for that. So we have to learn to live within the dictates of the laws of ecology, because every species throughout the entire history of this planet that has not lived within those borders has gone extinct. And we haven't been around that long and we won't be around that much longer unless we learn to live within those boundaries of the ecological laws. Now when we're talking about whales and dolphins, I happen to believe they're the most intelligent species in many ways. If anybody's taken biology 101, you know, you might recall that they, uh, they show you a picture of a rat's brain, then they show you a picture of a dog brain, then they have a chimp brain, and then you got the human brain. And a biology professor will say, you can see by the increasing uh, size of the brain and the uh, the more uh, pronounced uh, convolutions on the neocortex area that uh, the dog is uh, smarter than the rat and the chimp is smarter than the dog and humans, of course, are the smartest of all. They never, ever put an orca or sperm whale brain up there. It makes us look really, really stupid. 
The human brain is about 1,350 cubic centimeters. The orca is a 6,000 cubic centimeter brain. And the sperm whale, the largest brain to have ever evolved on the planet, is a 9,000 cubic centimeter brain. Not only that, all mammalian brains from mice to people are three-lobe brains, with the exception of cetaceans, four-lobe brains, the only four-lobe brains on the planet. And that fourth lobe is all connected with associative behavior. You're talking about an extremely intelligent creature here. But we don't recognize it because they don't have television sets and drive around in cars and wear clothes. That's how we measure intelligence. We spend billions of dollars searching through the universe looking for extraterrestrial life, and scientists go absolutely giddy at the possibility of finding a bacteria on Europa, yet we completely ignore all of these species that are all around us, which we just take for granted. You know, with that kind of money and effort and time was directed towards possible, we could possibly communicate with the whales. We possibly could communicate with the elephants. We don't know. We haven't spent any time doing it. We just dismiss them as irrelevant. And meanwhile, we haven't proven to be very intelligent in our own right because we spent, in fact, I think, what was it, a 53 days in the entire human history that we haven't been at war with each other. So, uh, you know, we certainly haven't proven to be very intelligent in that respect. I don't know of a single dolphin or whale war, uh, and I, I haven't even seen any, effort, any evidence of sharks going to war with each other. But humans certainly have adapted that to a very, very fine art, which, you know, can be debated on just on how intelligent or non-intelligent that is. But the fact is, is that we have to understand that if we're going to survive, we need to look at things in a completely different way. Our ships fly two flags that no other vessel in the world flies because we were given the flags of the uh, five nations of the Iroquois. And we fly those flags, and when they invited us to accept the flags, they said, we're giving these to you because you understand what we're trying to say is that nobody makes a decision in their life until they take into account the consequences and the effect of that decision on all future generations. And if we were to live our life in that way, to take into account what kind of world will our children's 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 children have, things will be far, far different than they are today. Because that child born 500 years from now is very much a part of your reality if you believe in the continuum of life, where we come from and where we go. And if you know where we've come from and you know where we're going, then you know where we are. And if you know where we are, then we can be at peace with ourselves, peace with the world, and peace with all of those other citizen species ranging from the bacteria to the great whales who are, along with ourselves, fellow earthlings in every respect and just as deserving of respect uh, as any other group of people are with each other. So thank you very much.